so it will be 834. 834. Jesus gave his life a ransom, your broke out for
The scripture reading tonight will come from Malachi chapter 2, verses 10 through 16. The book of Malachi chapter 2, verses 10 through 16. And it reads, Have we not all one Father? Has not one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously with one another by profaning the covenant of the fathers? Judah has dealt treacherously, and an abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah hath profaned the Lord's holy institution, which he loves. He has married the daughter of a foreign god. May the Lord cut off from the tents of Jacob, the man who does this, being awake and aware, yet who brings an offering to the Lord of hosts. And this is the second thing you do. You cover the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and crying, so he does not regard the offering anymore, nor he receives it with goodwill from your hands. Yet you say, for what reason? Because the Lord hath been witness between you and the wife of your youth, with whom you have dealt treacherously. Yet she is your companion and your wife by covenant. But did he not make them one, having a remnant of the spirit? And why one? He seeks godly offspring. Therefore, take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously with the wife of his youth. For the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce, for it covers one's garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore, take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. <clears throat> Let's pray. Father, we thank thee for this day, for the many blessings you've given us. Father, we thank thee for blessing us with another opportunity to come together and to worship thee and to learn more about thy name. Father, at this time, we are uh, thankful for all the material things you bless us with, Father, that we, we so often take for granted. Father, also at this time, we want to pray for all those on our on our sick and prayer list. Father, we pray that, that they might be uh, restored to health, that be thy will. Father, we pray for anybody uh, that, that we might know that is uh, spiritually sick, that is, that, that is strayed from thee. Father, we would ask that something might be said or done to uh, re- return them to you, uh, to return them to, to the right path before it's everlasting too late. Father, at this time, we also uh, would ask that if there be any sin that, that stands between us and thee, that, that it might be forgiven, so our prayers might come up before thee unhindered. We also, Father, are thankful for the eldership that we have here, and, we'll thank, and we are thankful for the, the leadership that they provide. Father, we would ask that you uh, continue to be with them, continue to bless them um, <clears throat> as they go about leading us down the pathway of right. Father, we at this time uh, also pray that you that the, the various works that we're involved in uh, might continue to be blessed and they might, might bear much fruit for thee. Father, we also pray that, that as we go throughout this service that you might be with us, Father, help us to keep the cares and the concerns of the world uh, out of our head, uh, out of our minds, so that we might wholeheartedly focus on Thee. Father, we ask that as we go about our life and our communities, that, uh, that You might be with us, help us to magnify You and to magnify Your Word in everything that we do. Father, we are thankful for everything You bless us with, and we ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Song for the lesson will be number five. If you'd like to stand for this song, please. I think we've sung in a while, but it's a beautiful song. There are things as we travel this earth's shifting sand that transcend all the reasons of man.
584. It would be beneficial if you had your Bible handy to that second chapter of the book of Malachi, which was our devotion reading a few minutes ago. It was a uh, uh, sort of an extensive reading, but we're going to look at some specific details in that particular Old Testament account and seek to be benefited by it, and I think that we can be if we set our mind to it, realizing that according to, of course, Romans chapter 15 verse 4, for whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Of course, the reference is that that Paul is making there to those things written aforetime with what we would call the Old Testament. All those Old Testament examples, whether it be in the patriarchal age or the Mosaic age, there are examples and principles that undergird the very nature of God, and the nature of God doesn't change. It doesn't change from the Old and the New Testament. So we see principles that are based upon God's nature that will continue to be constant throughout the totality of inspired scripture. Now, obviously, there'll be change in dispensations, diff change in worship procedures and things like that, but if you notice, it's always been wrong to commit murder. Notice I didn't say it's always been wrong to kill because it's not always been wrong to kill, but it is wrong to commit murder. There is justified killing, sometimes at the hands of the state in capital punishment cases. But that's another lesson in itself entirely. It's always been wrong to steal. It's always been wrong to lie. It's always been wrong to uh, deal falsely and, and speak in a derogatory way and slander your fellow man. Now, all these things are tied directly to the nature of God. Thus, they've always been wrong from the very get-go, from the very beginning. But there are other things, such as what we're going to be dealing with here, that have specific application to certain relationships that people sometimes choose to be a part of. And I'm thinking primarily of the oldest institution known to man, and that, of course, is the family, of all things. Now, and while I realize that the church, that divine institution, was is the mind of God from all eternity, as far as practically in being in place and active and functioning, the oldest one would be the family, the family unit. And we see a problem that exists in that family unit and how that people dealt with the situations that exist in that family unit in our devotion reading here in the last book of the Old Testament of all things. Of course, the, the parallel accounts of what's transpiring as Malachi is writing, of course, can be found over in the books of Nehemiah and Ezra. Somebody says, wait a minute, they're way back over there before the the poetical books. Well, the Old Testament is not in chronological order. And so to find a basis upon which Malachi is referring here in the book of Malachi, then we need to have some type of understanding of the book of Ezra and the book of Nehemiah, and we'll be referencing those as well. I've told you one time, or maybe multiple times, that when I, was, when I went to Tennessee Bible College uh, 200 years ago, uh, I was so naive as it related to a whole bunch of things, but especially with the very first class that I took under Thomas Eves, which was a class in marriage, divorce, and remarriage, a topical Bible study. I thought, now here I've done spent three years at Fred Hardeman, of course wasn't a Bible major, the subject never came up in the Bible classes that I took, but I thought that everybody understood the exact same thing that I understood relative to marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And lo and behold, when I get to Tennessee Bible College, and one of the first classes, I, the first class I take, we have to read seven different books written by seven different brethren, taking seven different positions, contradictory each other, on the subject of marriage, divorce, and remarriage. It blew me away. I couldn't believe it. Now, from a common sense standpoint, I could see very quickly there ain't no way all these fellas can be right because they contradict each other. And if it is the truth that I've always accepted to be true, that seemed to me to be pretty easily understood, then all these fellas maybe have sold a bunch of books and maybe have a following, but they're false teachers. And after I took that class, I know they are. They're false teachers. And while their books are still Bible 
And while there are brethren who take these positions that are promoted in these different books that have been written, they're all false doctrine. And it's not a false doctrine that's inconsequential either. And we'll see something about that in our lesson this evening. Sometimes when you talk to people about this particular subject, they'll say, well, really, you know, uh, it doesn't really matter what marital status a person finds themselves in because, you know, if they're in that marital situation that would be identified by Jesus, say, in Matthew chapter 19, at verse 9, as being in an adulterous relationship, then when they're baptized into Christ, that washes away all sins, and so it doesn't really matter how many wives they've had. They could have had a million, theoretically, but once you're baptized, then that washes away sin. Well, it does. It washes away all sins that people are willing to repent of. And the problem is, is that when a person thinks that they can wipe away an adult relationship, that's a sure sign they are clueless relative to what genuine repentance in actuality is. And then some will even take that position and they'll say, well, you know, I, I know this woman you're saying is an adulterous, I'm in an adulterous relationship and I don't have a right to be married to this woman. But doesn't the Bible say that God hates divorce and here you are trying to get me to divorce this woman? Well, you just heard read a few minutes ago in verse 16 here in Malachi chapter 2 that God hates divorce. Uh-oh. So have we got a quandary here? Have we got a, a contradiction here? Or is there a certain type of divorce that God hates that God hates? And then lo and behold, and of course this is obvious conclusion, there is another type of divorce, or another type of putting away that God demands to take place. Hmm. You know, sometimes those distinctions are completely overlooked. I mean, it's relative to many other words and many other concepts in the scripture. People will take a word or a concept and they'll run with it as if that's all there is to say about that passage or about that concept. For, for example, works. While no one is saved by works of merit, God requires us to work. God requires us to obey what he tells us to do. As a matter of fact, Jesus would even identify faith as being a work. Something that is required of us. So if we're going to take the position that the denominational world does, that you can't have any works at all, then we've eliminated faith, which they say is the only thing that's necessary. Well, you can't do that. We've got a contradiction going on there in our mishandling of the Scripture. See, well, the same thing holds true relative to this matter. No, obeying the gospel doesn't change an adulterous relationship into a proper relationship. But why and where would people think that that would be a justifiable reason to take? Well, obviously, it's from mishandling of this very passage that is our devotional reading. So let's look there at that particular passage of Scripture in some detail and get as much as we can out of it in a limit, limited amount of time. Mark it down. God hates divorce or God hates putting away. That's, what is that's the way the word is translated into King James God hates putting away or God hates divorce from scriptural wives. Period. He really does. Now, here's the situation that we're reading about here that has been twisted to try to accommodate this idea that you can't get a divorce and you shouldn't get a divorce and God would condemn you if you did get a divorce for any reason, which obviously is at odds with what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 19, 9, obviously. But where does that idea come from? Well, if you'll notice the reading of the text here, one of the problems that existed with this remnant of God's people. Now, let's focus on that just a second. When we're talking about the writings of uh, Ezra and Nehemiah and the writings of even Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, we're talking about the period of time in which the children of Israel, having been in bondage for 70 years, are given the opportunity to return to Palestine. So here they are. They have returned to Palestine. Who all went back to Palestine? Did everybody go? Everybody could. But only a small percentage even wanted to and did go back to Palestine. Only a small amount. Now, what do you call a small amount from a hole like that? I mean, you think that these people will be sitting on ready that whenever they have the opportunity to go back to their homeland, go back to Jerusalem, rebuild the temple, rebuild the wall around the city of Jerusalem, 
reestablish God's covenant with, with uh, the people here in the capital city and all that, they would have been only ready to do that. But they weren't. Now, there's obviously a number of reasons why they maybe decided to just stay where they was at. For some of them, it would have been a very long wagon train ride to get back to Jerusalem. I mean, a long way. And maybe about as long as going from, say, Kentucky to California, or maybe further. And they wouldn't have near the pretty territory to go through either. Much of it would be desert. Think of all of the exploits that could take place on the way back to your homeland, where you're getting to go back and go to. Would you be sort of sitting ducks for enemies? Yeah, sure would. Could you be robbed, maybe even killed? Could your men be killed and your wives and your kids stolen? Well, that might happen, you know. Or maybe they had established already businesses where they had set up these businesses in their respective areas, and so they would have to leave their means of employment and have to leave their money-making ventures if they went back to power. So ultimately, there was only a small percentage that went back. The numbers are given specifically how many from each tribe is given. And so you would have to refer to these people that go back as being a remnant of the people, a very small amount. Sometime when you have, have the chance or maybe even take the opportunity and make yourself the opportunity, go through the scripture and see this, this biblical doctrine of the remnant, of a small amount, the few as compared to the colossal whole, you know. It comes up all the time. And it doesn't surprise us that when we get to the New Testament, you know, that Jesus would even say, many are called, but few are chosen. And when you see the context, the context in which Jesus makes that assessment, He's talking about many people obey the gospel, but few will arrive safely in heaven one day. That's what he's saying. There's a remnant, small amount compared to the whole. Well, that's what you've got here. And you would think that since this is the remnant, and sometimes I've made the application as well concerning those that had assembled on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. I mean, here are some of the genuine, serious people, hopefully they are, who have come, and now they are assembled here on the day of Pentecost, which is one of the feast days that all men 20 years old and older were supposed to come, and well as everybody else. And so you got over a million people, but that's still just a remnant. And so here's the prime opportunity for the gospel to be preached to in its fullness for the first time, and it is. And out of, say, conservative estimate, a million accountable human beings, how many obey the gospel? 3,000. That's a remnant. Small amount. Everybody should have. Everybody that paid attention to what the law of Moses said relative to becoming Messiah, they should have jumped on the opportunity to become Christians, but only 3,000 did. I mean, that's better than 2,000. But still, that's a small number, comparatively speaking. So here, this remnant, who you would think would be sort of maybe the cream of the crop, they have gone back to Palestine. But it doesn't take very long before they do not resemble any such thing as the cream of the crop unless you have a very distorted view of what the cream of the crop is. The best of the best. Because what happens and is addressed here by Malachi in chapter 2 is in regards to their family structure. Hmm. Did you know that congregations are composed of families? Of course, families are composed of individuals, but the family is the source of stability in the church and in the nation. When you've got messed up, mixed up, destroyed families, then you end up with the collective group of destroyed families, and you've got a nation sort of like the one we've got right now. Same thing works with congregation. And the same principle we see on public display right here in the days of Malachi. There was problems in their home. Problems even in the family life of God's remnant, if you want to so classify them. And he noticed, and notice he, he, he specifies two specific problems with what's going on here. They had corrupted themselves through, and here's the terminology used, mixed marriages. Mixed marriages. Now, when I was young, Long, 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 long time ago. You know what? If you use the term mixed marriage, 
you know what would automatically come to the mind of some who claim to be members of the body of Christ? Some that hadn't paid much attention at all to what a mixed marriage in actuality is in the scripture, they would think, oh, white man, black woman, or black man, white woman. That's not what he's talking about. No. Now, that might be looked upon as a mixed marriage, but that's an insignificant mixed marriage. What we're talking about here is here you have God's people who are becoming one with or marrying heathens, idolatrous peoples, unbelievers, practitioners of ungodliness. And they are so wrapped up in what they're doing that it's a part of their very worship. And that was one of the attracting features of it in the land of Canaan, remember? Oh, man, if, if this is church, I want some more of it, they would say. Because they was only concerned with fleshly desires instead of what God would have them to do. So these religiously mixed up marriages in which they had taken themselves wives from the surrounding peoples, which if you'll recall was one of the restrictions that was given to the children of Israel when they first went into the land of Canaan to begin with. How did that turn out? Hmm. You know, we sometimes use a joke to describe the sad situation that existed there. You know, would you really like to go and sit down at a Thanksgiving meal if you looked across the table and there the mother-in-law on the other side of the table is Jezebel and her husband Ahab and she's carving the turkey? I don't want to be there. I don't trust that woman. She's a cutthroat. And so when you end up intermarrying with the heathen like that, you end up with not only messed up marriages, you end up with messed up kids who don't know the difference, who can't see a distinction, who are confused. Boy, I'm glad that that went away and then, aren't you? Well, no, it didn't go away then. Still's confusion because of the very exact same thing. They were forbidden to marry the heathen. Don't marry the heathen. And then, of course, the boys looked at the heathen girls, said they're a whole lot prettier than these girls over here that are Israelites, and so they married them. And the, and the girls said the same thing about those hunk of hunk of um, non-Israelite men. Oh, they're pretty, they're strong. And they suffered the consequences culminating in a fellow by the name of Solomon who's supposed to be so wise and rightfully is, but his strange, unauthorized wives turned his heart away from God. Surprise, surprise. Now, it shouldn't have been no surprise at all. And so this intermarriage with the heathen and adapting yourself to the idolatrous practice of these false, not authorized to be married to wives led to idolatry which resulted in the northern kingdom being carried into Assyrian captivity and the southern kingdom being carried into Babylonian captivity. And now here they are, after all this time, being taught a lesson, being disciplined by God for 70 long years, and now here they are starting the same procedure all over again? You've got to be kidding me. One thing we learn from history is that we don't learn from history. Sort of looks like that right here. Because they hadn't learned the lessons of history. All they had to do was look back just a few years and see Israel apostasy that was the end result of what they're doing right here. And the idolatry associated with it. I mean, it, it's, it's almost unbelievable. You think, how could people do that? Boy, if I'd have been there, it'd have been different. And yet we know that's fanciful theorizing because the same thing in principle happens today, and amazingly, people will seek to defend it. Amazing. Amazing. So what Malachi does, he reminds them that the unity that they had with God has been jeopardized to a great extent by marrying these women they had no right to be married to, which has caused them to be divided in their allegiance. Can you imagine that? And yet that's exactly what happened here. He even goes so far as to say in verse 10 that by them making this decision to marry these heathen women, they have in fact hindered their relationship with their Jewish brethren. 
with their Jewish brothers and sisters. As a matter of fact, they've shown a preference for heathens more so than their own brethren. They've shown a greater propensity for wanting to get along with those outside of God's family than those that are a part of God's family. There again, is that not still the case? Well, you know, as well as I do it is. There's people that rather fit in well in Sequatchie Valley with the denominational world more so than with a faithful congregation of God's people. That's a fact. Because that's what they do. So there ain't nothing new here. It's simply an Old Testament example of what continues even till our day. And notice some of the terminology that he uses here. He uses the concept of, of broken the covenant as being dealing treacherously and profaning the covenant. Sounds like some terrible sins they're guilty of doing. What were they doing? They were prioritizing things that they should not have been prioritizing. They were putting things above and beyond what they should have been. They were seeking these alliances with these women, even though some of them had, you know, they had the uh, uh, end result of getting in good with the heathens who happened to populate the same area. But it was a direct affront to God, so much that he uses a word that is uh, one of the most disgustful, disgusting, I don't know if disgustful, it ought to be a word if it's not. It's an abomination. It goes into an abomination. That's bad. It was an abomination that they were guilty of engaging themselves in. And that's exactly the way judgment was passed upon them because of that. And then he says this is, in fact, going to result in violence. Now, when you start reading here about the violence that is attributed to this situation here and uh, covering the altar or actually involved in the worship there's tears that are being shed, you know. Well, just exactly what's involved in that, I don't know conclusively, but I know some possibilities. When you tell individuals that they are unlawfully married to somebody else, and there are children who have sprung up to this unauthorized couple, then when God's will is to get rid of this wife who you don't have any right to have, then that might cause some pain and agony. No doubt about that. And if these tears are tears of sorrow that lead to repentance, them's good tears. That's kind of tears we need more of. But the situation here had resulted in terrible, terrible consequences. So it's clear from just this text and from a little historical setting here that God hated divorce from God-authorized wives, not unauthorized wives. So let's look at the second point real quick. and we'll have to talk faster here. God commands putting away or divorcing unscriptural wives. Now, you have to go back over to the book of uh, Ezra and Nehemiah to see that side of this equation. Okay, because what had transpired during this same period of time with others is that they had put away the wives of their youth, which means they had put away their covenant wives. That is, they had put away their Jewish wives, wives that they were authorized to be married to, and then they married heathen wives. So here's the situation. They've been married, and now they've put away those wives that they were legally allowed to have as wives. The marriage is consecrated. The marriage is right. It's authorized. But they put those wives away, and now they've married heathen wives. What do you do in a situation like that? Have the preacher to pray for you and stay in that condition? No. No. Uh, Say two Hail Marys and, and throw your hands up in the air and, and cross yourself a few times? No. You have to scripturally get rid of those wives you have no scriptural right to. That would be those wives that are without divine authority to exist as wives. 
and that family that may result from this unauthorized union. Now, I thought, I thought God hates putting away. Well, he does. If you're putting away or you're divorcing someone that you are scripturally married to, but he demands that you put away those to whom you are unscripturally married to. So you have to know the situation and the circumstances involved before you can make a determination as to where it applies in God's scheme of things. Notice in uh, Ezra chapter 9 at verse 3, Ezra prays to God these words, For we have forsaken your commandments and joined in marriage with the people committing these abominations. O Lord God of Israel, here we are before you and our guilt. No one can stand before you because of this. Now, what's the problem? Well, the problem is they've divorced. They have put away their scriptural wives, and they've married wives they didn't have a right to be married to. They're still bound by God to those original wives. And in legal parlance, while they may be married in the sight of civil government to those second wives, they are actually just living in adultery with those second wives because God has them still bound to their first wife. That's what the Bible teaches. That's what God said. I mean, I'm glad that there are things that have to meet the rules and regulations of the state, but we have to obey God rather than men. Just because the state says that a man can marry a man and a woman can marry a woman does not mean they can. Does God join a man to a man or a woman to a woman? No. Why not? Because they're not authorized by God to be married. Does God join together a man and a woman who is not scripturally a candidate to be married? No. God does not allow that. So he says, well, what? The law of the land, it don't matter what the law of the land says. Who is it that instituted marriage to begin with? The state of Tennessee, the United States of America, mankind in general? No, God did. God's plan is one man for one woman for life, with one exception. Except to be for fornication, Matthew chapter 19, at verse 9. So the claim that's made today in trying to appeal to this pastor of scripture in order to stay with an unauthorized spouse falls, fails the test, doesn't meet the restrictions, doesn't apply in the situation in which the inspired writer applies it in the book of Malachi. So what we ought to do is simply realize that if we, we find ourselves in a situation like this, and I'll honestly tell you, I've had situations in which I've studied with people and the boy understood. The girl who came from a background in the Lord's church didn't care. And then they call you on the phone and they say, could you meet us at the church building? I want to obey the gospel. I said, I'll meet you at the church building. I say, do you remember what we've been talking about? Yeah. He said, I told her this wasn't going to work. I said, what have we learned as we've stated this issue? He said, as we've stated this issue, I have come to the conclusion that I have to make a choice between the Lord and her. Now, that's not what I told him. That's what the scripture says. And he said, well, right now, I'm going to have to go with her. He knows where he stands. And it would have been a terrible inservice to him and to her and to the truth if I'd have said, oh, don't worry about it. Let's come on, get in the baptistry here, and I'll get you wet. No. There's coming a day in which we will have to give an account of the things that we've done in this life, whether it be good or bad. And the standard is not going to be what the United States government decides. It's going to be the word of Almighty God and the, the standard of Jesus Christ. Obey the gospel. 
be saved, stay saved, go home to glory. And take a biblical, scriptural, defendable, provable position on anything and everything. And you don't have to worry about leading somebody to believe something that's false. It may be in our audience this evening. There are those who have never obeyed the gospel, never become children of God, never been added by the Lord to the Lord's church because you've never obeyed that simple plan first revealed in its fullness on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. When they were convicted and convinced that they had, in fact, with wicked hands crucified and slain the Son of God, and they cried out to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? They were told, repent. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children, even those that are far off, as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And there were added to them that day about 3,000 souls. Verse 47 tells us those that were being saved, or at the same time being added by the Lord to the Lord's church. Have you done that? That's God's plan. Obey it tonight. Enjoy the same blessings and benefits that they did then. If you haven't passed, done that, but gone back into sin, don't stay outside of a covenant relationship with God. Come back home through repentance, confession, and prayer. If you'll let our, your desires be known to us as we sing this song, we'll assist you in any way. Would you come while we stand to sing? Tenderly, Jesus, save calling, calling for you and for me. Still on the portal, seems waiting and watching, watching for you and for me.
in the first verse, 621, if you haven't had an opportunity to take the Lord's Supper, you come forward and be seated on the front pew or raise your hand. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we humbly come before thee at this time. So thankful, dear God, for thy son and his great sacrifice on the cross. We pray this evening that you will be with those who partake of this loaf, which represents thy son's broken body as it hung on that cross. Help them to do so in a manner that's well-pleasing unto thee. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Pray for the cup. Dear Heavenly Father, in a likewise manner, we also come before thee so thankful for thy son's innocent shed blood on that cross and the power that it has to forgive us of our sins. We pray for those this evening who partake of this cup, which represents that shed blood, and help them to do so in a manner well pleasing unto thee. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Does anyone need to give that didn't have opportunity to give this morning? Let's pray. Mighty God, we're so thankful for every blessing in life that you so richly bestow upon us. We are blessed more than we deserve, dear God, and we just know that everything that we have here on this earth, that it comes from thee, and we pray that we'll be good stewards of the things that you blessed us with. Be with those this evening that give back and to thee, knowing, dear God, that these funds will be used to further uh, spread thy word, uh, not only up and down this valley and in this country, but all over the world, and help them to give with a cheerful heart. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day that you've blessed us with and the great weather and that you've allowed us to come out here and learn about you, Lord, and grow closer to you and grow close to each other, hopefully, Lord. And we thank you for all our teachers and Brother Freddie this morning and this evening that have taught us. And we pray, Lord, that you'll help us to hear it and learn from it and apply it to our lives. And we pray that you'll be with us as we strive to be more like you and your son, Lord, and go about the daily Christian life. And we pray that you will be with our country, Lord, in these times and help us to help other people come back to you, Lord. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen.